Welcome to Writer's Digest Presents. Hosted by the editors of Writer's Digest, this monthly podcast features conversations with writing and publishing experts whose insights will help ignite your creative vision, hone your skills, build your platform, and get your work out into the world. Welcome back to Writer's Digest Presents. I'm Managing Editor Mariah Richard, here with Editor-in-Chief Amy Jones, Senior Editor Robert Lee Brewer, and Editor Michael Woodson. This week, I'm super excited to say that we're going to be tackling the concept of world building. Later in this episode, I'll chat with urban fantasy author Whitney Hill about creating fantastical settings in fiction, and Robert has a great conversation with poet Janine Hall Gailey about world building in poetry. But before that, I want to pick my fellow editor's brains about this idea. Hey, everyone. Hey. Hey. <laughs> um, to kick us off, does anyone want to define world building for us in their own words? Yeah, I can go first. I have a very non-technical definition. Um, I was thinking it's more... I think the first thing I think of is setting, but I have learned through your world building articles in the magazine, Mariah, that it is so much more than that. Um, it's about creating the society and the norms that sort of um, contain the book. And I guess it's also anything that makes the readers feel like they are in the book, experiencing what the characters are experiencing. Um, that's sort of how I've started thinking about it lately. Yeah, and I, I totally, like, that's kind of how I feel about world building as well. It's just, it's kind of the 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 feeling you get when you're in the story. Um, and, and, and I agree with Amy. I originally always thought of it as setting when I first started writing fiction, that, you know, world building is just setting and describing stuff, but really it's the people, the culture, uh, the the media, the things that people are worried about and and all of that type of stuff. Yeah, same. I think it, it's one of those things where it starts for me was with setting and then atmosphere. And then it sort of focused in on what populates that setting and atmosphere and how sort of in a um, symbiotic way, whatever species of person inhabits that atmosphere helps with the world building as well. And I think something that's um, really interesting about world building is that generally, um, when we think about it from a literary perspective, we do think about it in terms of fiction, right? Mm -hmm. So we think fantasy, sci-fi, um, genres that really create a brand new world um, that readers have to be familiarized with. But when I um, when I was editing self-help books back in the day, <laughs> um, <laughs> I came to learn that world building is really just um, how you tell a story in a way that immerses your your audience totally within the story. Um, so I could be, you know, talking about the time that I went down to the coffee shop and I ran into an ex-professor. Um, but in telling that story, I'm building the, the world of the coffee shop. I'm showing you um, my perspective, which, you know, we could all go to the same place together and have wildly different experiences with it. So in in point of view in plot in setting all of these things are working in tandem to build the world of your story um and i think that's that's what really excites me about this topic um so my next question is like can i jump in a, real quick oh yeah absolutely sorry what you said about the coffee shop made me think about another like um misconception I had about world building before I, you know, really started working for Writer's Digest and getting to know the the concept of world building as a literary concept. You know, I took it very literally, world building, and associated it a lot in my head with building an entire world, mm. as opposed to <clears throat> deciding how to um, choose the part of, I guess I thought of Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> to some to some degree um you know there are so many worlds that they built a universe um but they had to build all of those 
those actual worlds, the planets that they're on. And so I thought of the world in world building as a planet, a full world. Um, and really it is, you, you have to choose how to contain it somehow, whether it is, you know, a community where there is a coffee shop and that is one piece of it, or are you really going to go huge and think about an actual, you know, invented universe or planet for your, for your characters? Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I think I used to think about it that way as well. But, you know, the the more that I've gotten into, uh, you know, really analyzing, like, that's kind of the fun thing about our job is we get to really sit back and analyze mm -hmm. things all the time. Uh, but, like, there's world building where you create an entire planet, but then there's world building, like, London and the fog, mm -hmm. you know, with... Uh, detectives running around or uh, depraved murderers or, you know, or whatever it is. Uh, and like that London is a world uh, in itself. And, and uh, you know, there's so many different ways you can spin it. And that's, that's still fiction. But then, you know, that's the same thing with nonfiction. There's like the world where uh, you're wor worried about people's health. And there's the world where it's just, you're just there to have a really good time and, uh, do really fun stuff. So, so, you know, it's, it is. Yeah. And something else that I think is, um, is really interesting. Like when, when you were talking about, um, like the container of world building, uh, I was recently at a conference, um, where I sat in on a panel about the monstrous in publishing. Um, so when I went into that panel, I was like, ooh, monsters, fiction. Um, but in it, they talked about um, how to tackle monstrous things in memoir. Um, so at the end of the day, um, as a fiction writer, the elements that you're employing to discuss like a fictional creature monster um, is some of the same aspects of world building as the memoirist is using to discuss trauma. Um, and that connection really astonished me um, because I never really thought about, um, when I think about fiction and I think about the way that um, particularly horror uh, deals with larger topics is um, a lot of times the monster can uh, be metaphor, right? It's a stand in for something else. Not always, but um, a lot of times it is. and. So it never really occurred to me that when you're tackling that, um, so for example, say you're tackling like the fear of being known, right? Or being seen. Um, you can do that through things like haunted mirrors um, in fiction. But you, if you're tackling that same theme, the fear of being known or seen in uh, something like creative nonfiction or memoir, um, like you're employing that that same theme using some of the same techniques, but you're stripping a lot of the metaphor out of it. Um, but there's still two monstrous things. So it, it was just a really interesting um, way that I think is gonna change the way that I read, um, if that makes sense. Because I think that like the more we become aware of these things as editors and writers, um, the more we approach reading in like a slightly skewed angle. Um, so I'm really excited to see like the next time I pick up a memoir, am I going to experience it the same way? Um, keeping those things in the back of my mind. Yeah, definitely. And, that, and that's like a, a cool point in itself. We, we won't get all the way down into it, but just how learning, learning and thinking about these different elements of writing end up impacting you the rest of your life when you're reading <laughs> stuff. <laughs> totally. Um, and I guess that does bring me to my next question. Like, as a reader, how do you determine if a writer has done world building well? For me, the, the reading the book, um, it's almost like I stop seeing the words and um, it sort of becomes a movie in my head to the point where I don't know that I have actively flipped the page. I just know that somehow I'm 30 pages further along than I was when I started. Um, because I have gotten so 
into the world that this writer has created um, that because I can identify immediately the point at which I'm taken out of it. And it'll be something that just seems slightly out of place, you know, a word or a phrase or something, a piece of dialogue that is, um, that doesn't seem quite natural that will immediately suck me out of my movie playing in my head. And that's when I start seeing the word on the page again. But until that, that point, the world is so real and I feel so into it, um, that I, I don't see the words anymore. I don't think I would make a very good editor of fiction because I'm not sure that that would actually be constructive feedback for any kind of writer. <laughs> I think for me, um, it, whether world building is done like quote unquote well depends on what kind of reader you are. Um, so for me, I don't need my world building to be um, what's known as hard world building. Like, I don't need to know the science down to a T of your world to be immersed in it. Um, so say I'm reading something that's like very like technical sci-fi. I don't need the science to be explained to me as long as like, like Vulcan nerve pinch. Sure. I don't need to know how that works. I just need to know that it does work. Um, and so I know, though, for a lot of readers, like, um, especially, um, I, I'm married to a huge Lord of the Rings fan, um, to the point where, like, I cannot ask a question during watching one of the films without, like, it needs to be, we need to pause it, and then we're going to get, like, an entire history lesson that's going to take an hour. <laughs> Because the way that he reads is he needs to know the answers to every question he could possibly have um, or else he doesn't really enjoy the book, which is why he doesn't read a lot of fiction um, where I'm not like that at all. So it, it really depends on like what kind of story your reader is looking for and if you've um, done enough of the technical basis um, to satisfy them. So for me, I don't need to have all the questions answered. Um, I'm more like you, Amy, where if you've really like captured my attention with your story and I'm fully immersed in it and I'm, you know, there with your characters, that's all I need. Yeah, I, I'm kind of like that too. And I think part of it is, I think it's any given s story. I don't really have like a feeling of this is what I think is the best version of world building. It's like, if this, did this book do it successfully how it wanted to do it? And, but for me, like what I find I um, prefer is just a certain level of restraint. Cause I think a lot of times with world building less is so much more and it offers a lot of confidence from the writer and, um, and it, it trusts me to sort of like go along with it and, be okay with being confused for a little while um because a lot of my favorite world building comes from magical realism and a lot of magical realism at face value is our reality but there's something different about it that makes it so specific and restraint um plays a big part of that so i think for me it's it's a lot of what's not on the page and what's um assumed and that what i can bring to it as as the reader of it yeah i think for me that's something that helps with world building is uh i when i'm reading it i feel like the author like really knows the world and the stuff right. that's off screen and that the characters are um doing their thing in this world that that makes sense um i i think when it's not done as well um it feels like things are kind of being made up as they go along <laughs> where That's you know like point. like i like i can go into something have no idea how like different things work but like the world building's done well if it feels like everyone else has like some kind of common understanding of what's going on and the history and the politics and stuff and eventually i'll start to learn all this stuff if i continue to follow them um but uh yeah for, for me that's kind of how it works 
it feels like a common thread among the, what each of us is saying is that like the writer has has the skill to do all of these different things but they're not necessarily like flaunting it in the writing they're not like showing off their ability to um you know create create this world system or you know write beautiful dialogue or construct a wonderful sentence it's that they do all of those things so well that even we as editors don't even notice it um and and it's just the story has captivated us in some way going going off of what um i've been hearing from you guys and and this just sparked in my mind um so i think for me uh, a lot of like successful world building is also done through um personality so i want to hesitate on saying like characters um because i think you can have like a really um like punchy kind of voice um like i think about uh terry pratchett whose like narrators are um like can be very engaging outside of um the characters themselves um but i'm thinking about specifically the martian by andy weir um which is um i i tend more towards like horror fantasy um like dark fiction less towards sci-fi um but that was a sci-fi novel that i really enjoyed specifically because all of the science was delivered uh through i believe the character's name was mark right um but he was like so funny and um the the novel was laid out in a way that it made sense that he an expert is explaining all of these things to us the layperson mm -hmm. um, and he did it in a way that didn't feel like i was sitting there reading a textbook um, so i think that when when sure. you are world building um, a completely new world the way that you can make that familiar to your readers through character or um, through personality of the narrator um, and just making sure that like when you do have to explain things to make make sense for your readership that you're doing it from that personality um, rather than just like and here's some information that you need to know <laughs> mm -hmm. right that's such a good point i hadn't thought about it in quite that way but that makes so much sense um having a a purposeful vehicle for giving this information to the reader can really make all of the difference yeah totally and um sometimes like i, I think something that maybe people don't think about as much when, with world building is um thinking about tone and and I think maybe that's the same. Like it's maybe yeah. it's just a different way of saying personality, is uh, that uh, thinking about like tone of a world um, makes a difference. You know whether you're there, there's a big difference between you know you could both you could have two different stories like at the same we'll say coffee shop as the example, but. Uh, this table over here is a rom-com while this one over here is like a murder mystery and they're, you know, tossing back theories or whatever. So, uh, you know, you can both be like in the same exact place at the same exact time, but like the tone is different for these like, two different worlds. So, so thinking about um, as a reader or an editor, what um, book or books really surprised you or impressed you with their world building? Um, I brought a couple of, of examples. Um, the first one, I will say, um, this episode comes out in May and our May, June issue of the magazine, Yay. which I got at my house today, <laughs> um, is wow. an interview with Kate Quinn. And I knew her from, um, my introduction to her was reading the Alice Network, which was the Reese Witherspoon book that, um, lots of people read about world war one um i did not realize that until i was preparing to interview her that she had written a quartet of books about ancient rome um, which is not a time period that i know a lot about but 
through those four books, um, I got such an interesting, very vibrant um, image of that time and place in my mind. And it was because, um, you know, they were traveling throughout the city and there were these recognizable places that still exist, um, but they were being used in the in their original purpose, you know, like the Colosseum, it was very bloody in that place. And while now it's a lovely tourist attraction, um, she showed the, she so, showed that world, um, in a very different, in a very different way. And through the four books, it was, um, you know, I saw a different piece of it every time, which was, um, I don't know, a delightful change of pace from the, other historical fiction that I that I read, which coincidentally also takes place in Europe, um, just at a different time period. The other one that um, that I wanted to mention was *A Gentleman in Moscow* by Amor Tolls, and I mentioned earlier the idea of containing the world, and you know my initial impression of world building was that of a full actual planet style world. But A Gentleman in Moscow takes place entirely in one hotel. The entire book, um, this entire man's life, he is his entire adult life, essentially. He is in this hotel and he cannot leave. And the book um, is very contained in that way. And you really get to know the inner workings of this hotel. And in my mind now, um, I can see where the flower shop is in the Metropole Hotel in Moscow. And I have an idea of what the kitchen looks like and where the Count's room is up in the attic <clears throat> and how he discovered another doorway that went into another room. But the whole, the way you, um, the way that came to life in my mind was seeing it through the perspective of this man who is forced to live there. Um, and if he leaves, he will be captured by um, the Soviet, um, not the KGB at the time, but the precursor to the KGB. Um, so you get to see and appreciate the, um, the dark corners of the hotel and it has become this man's entire world and how he can have a full life um, within the constraints of this one building. And I just thought that was... Uh, it was incredible. It was a beautiful book. I think uh, for me, um, there, there are so many great examples of world building that I kind of wanted to start with the one that kind of launched world building in my head as like a concept. And that was uh, Anne Rice and her uh, Vampire Chronicles. Mm. And she also wrote a series of books about the Mayfair witches and I believe even like her one off the money um, they were all like kind of in the same world that happens to be in our world but uh, it's like this secret world going on without us realizing it with vampires, witches, mummies all completely believable a secret society that uh, studies all of these phenomena as well um, that's made up of like actual like humans just normal people and uh, she makes it like Anne Rice makes it like so believable uh, for my concept of what New Orleans was uh, as a teenager it was all created by Anne Rice and the same thing with uh, San Francisco like it's Anne Rice's San Francisco Anne Rice's New Orleans uh, Anne Rice's uh, Europe to a certain extent. Um, so for me, like that was like kind of like the thing, the, the big world building that really like launched it for me. And what got me to read it was listening to my brother and my mother talk about this world because they were reading it first and listening to them. I was like, whoa, I need to like get some of this, whatever you guys are on uh, and, and talking about. So uh so that's kind of like where it all started for me. And then I was also thinking about a nonfiction example. Uh, Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City for me is like a really good example of world building uh, from a nonfiction uh, 
perspective and the way that he creates uh, Chicago at uh, the turn of the century for uh, the World's Fair and um, uh, just like like you feel like you're there and like you're in the city, you're on the fairgrounds and, and going through um, like, like that they, they, you know what how, how it actually transpired, which is a great, great world building as well. Yeah, I think period stuff like what Eric Larson does is so can do really good world building. I read Thunderstruck by him and same thing. And it almost felt like a fever dream reading it because I know I haven't experienced this and it's living in this dark space in my brain as if I have been there. And in that time period was just like, unlike anything I'd ever read in nonfiction, not one of my picks, but I wanted to uh, say that <laughs> my first pick pick sure <laughs> book I'm bringing to the chat is called Poppy Show by Leone Ross. It's also, sorry, gorgeous cover. It is a gorgeous cover. Look at that. Um, it's magical realism and is inspired by her Jamaican homeland, the authors. So a lot of it is tangible and realistic, but then it's an impossible, impossible book to describe. So just mm -hmm. listeners and fellow editors, please just look up the description. Um, just incorporated into the atmosphere is just a lot of, uh, fantasy adjacent stuff that like magical realism often plays with but at no point is anything articulated or or uh described t taken any moment to say this is what this means and this is this it just it just says these things and never quite defines that this kind of person is a god and this person has this special skill it just it trusted me to eventually understand that and it just made me feel like i was i was actively realizing i was becoming a better reader in reading it because the the world building was just unlike anything i'd ever read before and another one is kind of out there but um in the unlikely event in the unlikely event by judy bloom it came out like in 2014 or 2015 and it's the last i think it's the last book she wrote as a late and it's um, only her second book for adults. And it takes place in the 1950s in New Jersey, where three separate planes come crashing into this small town. And so like the world around that is very important and that it takes place in this tiny town is so much a part of the story. And it felt so real to me. And uh, the whole time I was reading it, I was like, I'm loving this. This is extraordinary. The hardest part was like, there's no way three planes could crash into this tiny town in the same year. That's bananas. And then in the acknowledgments at the end, it says that this actually happened to Judy Bloom in her lifetime in this small town. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so my only criticism for it is not real. Like this, okay, fine, school me. But um, I just like, because it's very realistic fiction. And the world technically is very realistic, but I was there the whole time. And she, her writing style really helps with that because she's very, um, she's not very flowery in her language. She just writes things as they are. And it made it feel, I think, that much more realistic. Um, when you were speaking, it like jogged a, a memory of, um, like it made me feel something about a book that I read a long time ago that was like not on my list but is on my bookshelf there um so i i turned to check the the title and it's the rest of us just live here by patrick oh, ness i love patrick um, ness. and i'm not sure if you guys have read that book but the basic premise is that um it's set in a high school where there is like the chosen one and um she has her story going but it's the book is not about her. It's about the mm. others, like a group of friends who are just going to this high school when like all of this stuff is going on around them. Um, and the world building was interesting to me specifically because it, it came from a very different sure. angle, right? Like they don't have anything to do with her journey, like the hero's right. journey until the very end. Um, but they are having journeys of their own because like 
every teenager is the hero of their own growing up, yeah. right? Um, so that was a that was something that I don't even <laughs> remember what you said, Michael. <laughs> that I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Um, reminded me of reading that. But on my list, I do have um, literally anything written by Victor Laval, um, who I believe is like a master of world building. Um, but specifically, if I have to name one book, I'm going to say The Changeling, um, just because like, I, I can read that book a million times and still find new pieces of the world um, that are like it, it unearths itself slowly, I feel, um, is also just extremely beautiful and emotional. Um, and then recently, uh, I've read The Witch King mm. by H.E. Edgman, um, which is, I, I want to call it uh, magical realism because the novel starts in our world and then um, travels into, like very quickly, travels into a fey realm and then we're in the fey realm for the rest of the book um so i can see an argument for people saying that it's more of like a high fantasy um because the fey realm is a, it's like an adjacent realm to our world but it's not earth um but they have things like uh like a big plot point has to do with a bewitched telephone because the Fae are trying to uh, update, right? So they're like, oh, humans use telephones. We can like make our own telephone and like have it do magic stuff, which I just think is like super cool. Genius. Um, and so uh, that one actually has a second book coming out this year in case you're interested. Um, but then something else I've recently read, uh, is Lee Bardugo's Ninth House. Oh. Um, I... which if, if you know me as a person, like I will start a book, I will read like <laughs> three chapters and then I will stop reading it for like eight months and then I'll pick it up and I'll finish the rest of it in one day. <laughs> so that was kind of my experience with Ninth House where I was like, oh man, I'm really enjoying this book. And then like put it down and, and was just like, I'll get back to you. <laughs> um, but I finally did very recently and oh my God, like blew me away. Um, I I really enjoy her young adult writing, but I just think that her her um, writing for adults is like just perfection. Um, I think that has a sequel coming out too. Yes. And they just released the cover design for it, which um, it's it's very like a spooky cover. But if you've read Ninth House, like just because of the cover i'm like so excited for the plot of this second book because like i know that the cover has like a lot of meaning um but i'm not gonna <laughs> i'm not gonna spoil it here for you you'll just have to read it <laughs> um but yeah they they just announced the sequel to that one as well so i think i think that's where i'm gonna cut myself off because like <laughs> literally if it's on my bookshelf i've enjoyed the world building so we'll just, we'll just <laughs> press pause on that um but before we end our chat, I, I did want to ask, does anybody have any final advice for writers who are building their worlds? This is going to sound like, duh, but I guess I'd say like, if you're, if your intention is to do a specific type of world building first, like write everything you know about it and then, and then learn how to, what to take out. And cause I do, I think for me, just like the best world building is what is off the page and the confidence in the author to know what to take off the page. Um, so I think, yeah. And, and just do it confidently. Like chances are nobody's read the world that you're creating. So it's, that's already pretty cool. It's funny. I think my advice is almost the exact opposite and it might be because of the type of people we are. Um, yeah, perfect. the idea, my advice was to don't let the idea of world building overwhelm you and to maybe take it a piece at a time because that's what, um, what gets to me is when I think about, oh, I've got to create this entire thing, I, I get overwhelmed by it. I mean, I think if if I were to like break it down, think about a piece of it, like a specific location or, you know, and then build from it, then it might not seem so daunting. Yeah, and I'm going to tie both of those together because uh, I just recently went through an experience with Mariah's 
uh, flash fiction challenge that helped me finally get this world that I've been building in my head and on paper since like 2016, but I just did not have the stories. Like I knew that I had stories that needed to be told about this specific world and I'd been building it and building it and building it, but I just couldn't quite get into any of the specific stories, even though I, like I knew different things that happened in this place. But then with Mariah's flash fiction challenge, I was like, okay, like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take her prompt each day and I have to keep it at 1500 words or less and tell a story. And then the next day do the next thing and then do the next thing. And then that helped me like kind of through that process of keeping stuff short, helped me like kind of unlock the world and start telling the story, which has been really exciting um, since. Like I've kind of kept up that habit of just writing a little bit uh, each day around like a certain prompt. And um, so, so like I, so like I, I agree with both of those is like, you know, like definitely like build this big world, but then like, don't get overwhelmed by it. Like start just telling stories because after you've written it all, you can go back through and start to kind of iron stuff out, I guess. Like, <laughs> uh, there, there are things that, like, when the beginning of February, uh, the, the story at the end of February, like, it started to take shape, like, halfway through the month. So, like, by the end of the month, like, I knew what the story was at the beginning. Like, I was just like, okay, I'm starting off. I think the first prompt was, like, something to do with a key. So I was like, I'm just going to have somebody locked out of their house. We're going to go from there. <laughs> and, uh, and then I figured it out as I went along and, and you know, can go back through and, and tighten stuff up elsewhere. Keeping things short helped me unlock the world. It was beautifully said, Robert. And... It was like an aha moment for me. As yeah, a I mean, it's, it's only taken me 40 something years to figure this out. So, and, and yeah. who knows what else I don't know. <laughs> it, it was funny for me to answer this question um, because I do write the Building Better Worlds <laughs> column for the magazine. So it's like all my advice is in the column, go read it. No, but for me, honestly, um, at the very core of it, being straightforward and consistent will always serve your story better than trying to be clever. Um, I think at the end of the day, we try to be different or um, sparkly, uh, but really you're the only one who can tell your story. So as long as you just focus on telling the story, everything else is gonna fall into place eventually. Love it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for this great chat. And um, stick around because we're going to be talking to authors Whitney Hill and Janine Hall Gailey. This is Robert Lee Brewer. And I'm here with poet Janine Hall Gailey to discuss, among other things, world building and poetry. Janine Hall Gailey is a poet with MS who served as the second Poet Laureate of Redmond, Washington. She's the author of six books of poetry, Becoming the Villainous, She Returns to the Floating World, Unexplained Fevers, The Robot Scientist's Daughter, Field Guide to the End of the World, winner of the Moon City Press Book Prize, and the SFPA's Elgin Award. She has a book upcoming in 2023, Lair Corona from BOA Editions. She's also the author of PR for Poets, a nonfiction guide to help poets publicize their books. Her work has been featured on the Writer's Almanac, First Daily, and the Best Horror of the Year. She holds a BS in Biology and an MA in English from the University of Cincinnati, an MFA from Pacific University. Her poetry has appeared in journals like the American Poetry Review, Plowshares, and Poetry. Her personal essays have appeared on Salon.com and The Rumpus. Her website is wwwwebish 6 thenumbercom And you can follow Janine on Twitter and Instagram at Webish6. Welcome to the Writer's Digest Presents, Janine. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, today we're going to be uh, discussing world building and poetry, uh, but I wondered if you could just go ahead and start us off by reading the title poem from your collection, Becoming the Villainess. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Becoming the Villainess. A girl, love-locked, alone, wanders into a forest where lions and wolves lie in wait. The girl feeds them caramels from the pockets of her paper dress. They follow like dogs. Each day she weaves for twelve brothers, twelve golden shirts, twelve pairs of slippers, twelve sets of golden mail. She sleeps under olive trees, praying for rescue. In her dreams, doves fly in circles, crying out her name. For a hundred years she was turned into a golden bird, hung in a cage in a witch's castle. Her brothers are all turned to stone. She cannot save them, no matter how many witches she burns. She weeps tears that cannot be heard but turn to rubies when they hit the ground. She lifted her hand against the light and it became a feathered wing. She learns the songs of mockingbirds, parakeets, pheasants. She wanders into the forest more herself. She speaks of her twelve stone brothers. There's a dragon curled around eggs. There's a princess who is also a white cat and a tiny dog she carries in a walnut shell. She befriends a reindeer who speaks wisdom. They are all in her corner. It seems unlikely now she will ever return home. Remember what it was like, her mother and father, the promises. She will adopt a new costume, set up shop in the witch's castle, perhaps lure young princes and princesses to herself to cure what ails her, her loneliness, her grandeur, the way her heart has become a stone. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Like when we first were talking among ourselves uh, and planning out this episode on the editorial side, I thought, you know, we talk about world building so much in fiction, sometimes even in nonfiction, but we don't often talk about it in poetry. And uh, once I started thinking about it with poetry, uh, you were the first poet that I, I thought about for this. But uh, I wonder... Um, do you think about world building when, when you go into your poems or does it just kind of happen that way? I think that, I think I've, when I talk to younger uh, people, when I do like workshops for young people, I always say that it's a good idea to use fiction writers tool sets, even though we're not fiction writers. So things like dialogue characters, um, it's why I have so many um, poems in persona is because you're allowed to create characters and you can have them do what you want and you can have entire poems in dialogue like a play if you want. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think I've thought of it that way from the beginning, like almost like each book is its own world and you are building mm -hmm. poems into that world. So when I write a book, it's usually a pro people call them project based books, but it, mine are really little worlds. Right. And there mm -hmm. are other poets who do this too. I, I was thinking of a couple um, off the top of my head or, um, uh, Leanne Rory Poe has one called Tsunami versus the Fukushima 50, where she has a fictional character called Tsunami that speaks back to Japan after the uh, Japanese um, nuclear disaster and tsunami. Uh, Banana Palace, in which Dana Levin imagines a apocalyptic world with a game show for people who eat because nobody eats anymore. Or um, even Mattia Harvey, this was a few years ago, but wrote a book called Modern Life that had robots who were surrogate children and um, everything was war all the time. There's a lot of war in the book. And I was like, oh, those people, they're creating a world within their mm -hmm. books. They're not just writing poems that like maybe go together. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So. Yeah, I, I think for me, a lot of times, like I'll write poems and think about them as like their own thing and then try to like kind of tie them together later. But uh so so when you're coming at it, are, are you thinking more like you've got this world and you're writing these different poems within the world or or within like kind of the same like kind of sensibility or? I usually get stuck on a subject, you know, mm -hmm. um, with Becoming the Villainess, it was comic books, mythology and fairy tales. And so I had this balloon. Here's this balloon. I fill it with poems. And then how do I make that into a a logical book sequence, right? Like what's the arc of that book? Who are the characters in it? How do you, how do you fill in gaps if you have gaps in the story? Um, Robot Scientist Daughter was sort of like that too. That was an autobiographical book, but I took the, the, 
world there was Oak Ridge, Tennessee, right where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how can I make that? How can I expand that world, that universe from just, you know, just me and, and my father who worked at Oak Ridge into like, now we have a robot scientist daughter who turns into a robot and goes into space. And uh, so I, you know, again, it's a balloon that fills with possibilities, right? So you can kind of, and Field Guide to the End of the World started with the title poem, which, um, you know, I thought, oh, what, what if we had a field guide? What if we had a, because I was a biology major, that was my, my first degree. You know, we had field guides to birds, field guides to plants. What if we had a field guide to the end of the world, an instruction manual? And so I started writing, I, I wrote one in the voice of Martha Stewart. I, in one, one's a letter to Ina Garten in the Hampton surviving the apocalypse. So it was just sort of the idea of how do we navigate the end of the world, which which turned out to be more prescient than I wanted it to be. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wrote about like a plague in here, but I didn't mean for it to happen. I'm really sorry if I did that. I apologize to you. <laughs> so I, I, I spoke it into being. Now I think I better write a really happy book next time. Next time. Really yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's uh, that's really interesting, though, too, because, um, you know, like I do a lot of uh, prompting of poems on the Writer's Digest site. Uh, but this sounds like in a way, like if you have like this concept to start from in a way, it's like kind of a, a way to generate your own prompts because right. you've got like this idea of, of where you're, you're coming from. And just like with fiction, you know, fiction writers don't come at their books all the time with all the characters fleshed out, right? So maybe a character pops up you weren't anticipating or um, you, you allow changes to the arc of the book because that's what that book seems to call for. So it's, it is, in a way, it is like writing fiction. You, you set yourself up a world and then you say, okay, and maybe I write 150 poems inside that world and then like 70 of them make it into the book. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it is it is kind of a great prompt to think, OK, if I was going to create this fictional world for this book, what would I what would I create? Would it be terrible? Would it be fantastic? Would it be in space? Would it have mm -hmm. robots? You know, these are questions we should be asking ourselves. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. And I, I imagine like and, you know, like I don't know, but I imagine that might make it easier when you get to that process where you feel like you have. Enough publishable poems for a collection to, to actually bring it together like as opposed to like my process when i'm writing like just one-off poems on a range of subjects sometimes when i go to like put them together you know they might have been published you know in great journals but like when you actually go to put them together you're like these pieces don't fit <laughs> together right. well it's a big thing in manuscript organization you know you I almost think of it like a plot. And, you know, some novelists write outlines for their books and some don't, right? That's like a famous mm. thing. But, like, you can almost write an outline for a poetry book. And, and a, so for Becoming the Villainess, I had this huge mass of poems. And my husband was like, what about putting it in the arc of a comic book? Mm. And I was like, oh, that makes sense, right? And so then I rearranged everything and shuffled it all and said, okay, this is how do comic book origin stories start, right? Innocent person, bitten by radioactive spider, comes a superhero, then gets corrupted and becomes a bad guy. You know, that's the, that's the arc, right? So, mm -hmm. so and do it, using that arc does help you kind of rearrange things in a way that would make sense. Yeah. It's harder to do that with real life, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Yeah, um, things always fit in the, in the right order when you're, when they're happening in real life. Yeah. So, um, so that's like interesting for like world building, like on a, on a big scale, um, like getting down into like the, specific poems like are, are there things that you like like elements that you try to like incorporate like to to build your world because uh, like i know like getting ready for this uh episode i started looking through different poems and was actually like kind of surprised like some of the poems were like i feel like there might be some well if I say like there's good world building, then there's good world world building for me, uh, anyways. But like when when you're coming into a poem, like what what types of uh, elements, I guess, on a yeah. on a poem by poem scale are, are you looking at? So sometimes I focus a lot on scene. Sometimes I'm focusing on mood. Sometimes I'm focusing on characters. Um, like I said, sometimes I just write dialogue poems where characters are interacting with each other. Um, in Field Guide, I wrote a series. This was kind of the idea that started that book this series of postcards that this 
this wondering survivor of the apocalypse is writing, but she's writing them to nobody. You know, there's no mail service. There's nobody. She she doesn't find anybody. She travels all over the place. She doesn't find anybody. But she's leaving postcards at all these different locations. The Viceroy Hotel in L.A. and um, Unnamed Island in the Pacific Northwest. You know, she's she just searching for people and doesn't find anybody. But the idea of these ghost postcards that just would be like an artifact after an apocalypse was really intriguing to me. And and how. Um, a woman like me would would face the apocalypse if if there was no other if there were no other people around. Then what would you do, and how do you set up that world to make it believable? Because I wanted those those poems to be believable in the current day as well, right? Like I wanted them to work mm -hmm. as poems. I wanted them to work in the current day, but I also wanted them to work, it kind of in the I am legend sense. You know, what do we do when the world is empty? Um, mm -hmm. And did you know Mary Shelley wrote the first apocalypse novel, the dystopia where everybody's dead? She wrote a plague novel. I read it at the beginning of the pandemic and I was like, what, what? First of all, <laughs> like nobody tells us that Mary Shelley wrote more than one book. And then when mm -hmm. you do, and it's this really super, it's like almost a Victorian book of manners, which is not what you expect from an isolated apocalypse book. Anyway, if you ever get a right. chance, I think it's out of print or something, but you can find it on Amazon, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I think I had read about that i have not actually read it though um, yeah it takes my, it's a, it's my a wife's different. a huge mary shelley, mary shelley fan, fan. Though, so. yeah yeah she it's a, it's a very it's just a completely victorian approach to the apocalypse which you know i wouldn't be as victorian you know because i i didn't grow up in that time period but but her approach mm -hmm. is like very she has ma i mean the whole time she's dealing with the apocalypse her, her main characters always have manners and you know graceful speech and you know they're not stabbing each other you know so it's it's very much yeah. of her time, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's always, it's, it's interesting how different cultures would face the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> so. But we've been thinking about it a long time, and we're not yeah. the first generation to think about right. it, right? Remember all that apocalypse stuff in the 70s when we were, I assume you and I are close to the same age. When we were kids in the 70s, <laughs> every children's book was literally about surviving the end of the world or being left mm -hmm. on an island or being left in a mountain or your parents die and you're left in some place and you have to survive this. That is what we grew up with. So, right. you know, we're equipped. We're equipped for the We were equipped for this pandemic, you know? Yeah. 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 We, were like, I, I, yeah, we, all, we better keep some dry cereal around just in case, you know, some canned food, some, some extra penicillin, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think everything that's happened in the past couple of years has, it's been very triggering for for bringing me back to my childhood yeah, that's it. For, <laughs> for the for things me, that i worried about and i quit worrying about and yeah yeah well and my it all grand, comes back i was remember my grandmother um sent me this series of books called have you ever heard of the foxfire books i i've heard of them i have not read them so there's a poem referencing it in field guide to the end of the world because that was a book my grandmother sent me when i was a child and it's like how to survive um how to skin a pig <clears throat> and prep it for eating which you know at seven probably wasn't going to put that into practice but like how to plant peas so that they survive in different weather types how to how to do a, how to make your own dressing for a wound like it's just a very mm. interesting book to own as a child right <laughs> because in case you need it th there's the foxfire books and and people talk about your preppers that's not a new idea people have been prepping <laughs> for a long time that's not mm. a I'm sure now the billionaires are into it like building bunkers in new zealand and whatnot but they weren't the first they, I don't think yeah, they're in the first generation to do that. Yeah, and it's very interesting when you when you give it to a child as well, because like I know for myself, the the amount of uh, exposure I had to people like falling into quicksand and stuff. Like quicksand. I start I start to build like this worldview that as I get older, I'm going to have to worry about quicksand. It's always quicksand, like on a daily basis. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's <laughs> with I don't think those two things exist in the same place, but. For some reason, that was, and and then remember all the nuclear war stuff. Day after tomorrow, mm -hmm. like children's books about how, nuclear war and how that Hiroshima was a big subject in like my third grade library. For some reason, I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, that's that's dark for an eight year old, you know? No, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is that really the right well. thing to be giving us? Yeah. So, yeah. oh well. At least, at least it, you know, now with all this, we actually do have the threat of nuclear war. You know, for us, it's not the first time we've worried about it. And it isn't for people who survived the 60s, too. You know, those guys went mm -hmm. through the Bay of Pigs invasion where there actually could have been, mm -hmm. you know, nuclear war. And there wasn't. But <laughs> it's not anyway, it's not the first. This is not our first rodeo with this fear. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, it's but but it's it's also like kind of bringing it back to world building, though. Um, it is 
it, it shows how if you do build it around, like I, I liked how you talked about, you know, it might be a, an image or a setting, but you also had mentioned like, um, I'm not sure if you used the word emotions, but, but mood, something yeah. to that effect, mood. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I believe strongly like mood can be a, a major element of yeah. World of course, building. of course. And there is sometimes you just write a poem that's a mood poem, you know, you don't know where it goes, mm -hmm. but like at mm -hmm. some point it will fit in somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Well, uh, we've been talking about um, world building in poetry, but you also, before I let you go, I, wa I want to mention that you had your uh, book on PR for poets. Yeah. And I kind of want to like, well, oh, good <laughs> way to use the book. <laughs> see. Um, so um, I kind of want to go from uh, world building and poetry to like, how do poets get their poetry out into the world and, and in front yeah. of people? And since you've written the book on it, I wonder if there's like one piece of advice. It's like kind of your favorite piece of advice from that book. Yeah, I think maybe, I mean, the book is full of tips and it has a calendar in it. It has lots and lots of things. Um, and I'll probably have to write a new version of it at some point because I didn't even know about Instagram when I was, I was like, there's Instagram. I don't know. You know, that was sort of the hand waved at it, but now, you know, bookstagram is a big thing. Book TikTok is a thing. I'm, it's crazy. So all I would say is to play to your strengths for one. Uh, can I give you two? Because I actually have two. Oh, okay. Yeah, so definitely. one is play to your strengths. If you're not a big, you know, so if you're an introvert, a lot of writers are, there's a lot of stuff you can do to, to publicize your book without even going out of the house, right? Like you can write postcards, get a list of your friends, maybe like your Christmas card list, your holiday card list, send them postcards with the cover of the book and information on where to get it. Maybe a personal message to your friends because your friends and family are definitely going to want to hear about your book. Your alumni association wants to hear about this stuff, right? So do that first. You know, you don't, you don't have to go out and say hi. You just have to say hi in a postcard. Easy, right? Or like in social media, if you hate social media, don't kill yourself doing social media. But if you like it, if you're good, if you're one of those persons that if you want, I'm not saying just millennials, but millennials, they, they tweet a lot, right? Like eight times a day. So if you're a millennial, go with it, right? Do your tweets and, and people aren't going to get bored of that. So whatever you're good at, you know, kind of play to your strengths. The other thing, and if you're a great in-person reader, do that by all means. But I'm like, not everybody can go travel the world reading in, in bars and coffee shops across America, right? So you know, if you're if you're not good at that, don't freak out because I don't even think that's the main way people sell books anymore. You know, especially with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. The other thing is prepare and and don't assume that the publisher is going to do everything. And I'm getting a bigger publisher for this next book, but most of my publishers have been pretty small. I think that's more more normal than not. So if you have a small publisher, one or two people running the show, you can't expect them to go out and like paper the world by a New York Times ad you know, put your stuff in magazines, it's, it's probably not going to happen. So just be prepared to do some of the groundwork yourself. Um, yeah. And that's what the book talks about. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to be a superhero of publicity. You don't have to be a charming, charismatic person. You don't have to know everything about marketing. You just have to find one or two things you are good at and do those things ahead of time. Yeah. Those are both uh, great pieces of advice. And uh, I think a lot of times it's, easy to get overwhelmed thinking that you have to do everything, everything. that everyone else does right. right but everybody else isn't good at the same things you are right so right. they have their strengths i you know i'm not going to do a bus tour of america that's not going to happen i'm handicapped that's it's not super fun so you know I, i'm going to figure out a different way and and that's mm -hmm. that's how everybody is you know we all have our things that we want to do and don't want to do you know if i love awp and you hate it you know Stay home. I'll go to AWP and have a great time, you know, but that's okay. It's okay for us to do two different things with our books, you know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, I hope that's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It def yeah. Publishers it definitely that, uh, is. Publishers at home saying, oh, my God, no, tell them to go to AWP. They have to. <laughs> tell them to do everything. They have to. One of us tour, they have to do it. Everybody has to do yeah. it. I'm just kidding. No. Uh, great. Well, um, if you're a uh, game, I'll, I'd love to hear uh, one more of your poems. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll read this one. This is kind of one of the intro poems um, that I wrote um, to Field Guide, even before I'd really put together this book. It was sort of a pre a preamble. And my mother, interesting fact, I w was like the head of disaster preparedness for Cincinnati Bell at some point. 
So this is where I got this. And she said something to me when I was, I think I was in college. She was like, you really, you can't, you can't really prepare for this. You're never really prepared for the disaster. You know, you can do all this stuff. You can have these guidelines, but you know, when it happens, everything's sort of nuts. So it goes to chaos. Anyway, so this is called Introduction to Disaster Preparedness. While you told me about the bee colony collapse caused by cell phones or maybe Monsanto, I was thinking about a friend who said they found a lump, and another friend finishing chemo and waiting for a scan, and a third who said my hair is a disaster and she meant the layers would take forever to grow out. My house is a disaster, she says, my yard, my outfit. When you told me my son is autistic, I thought of his bright eyes and beautiful tears. It's not the life you planned. How our minds and bodies spin apart like hives of bees confused about who to follow, flying further and farther out to discover what? That they'd flown too far and now are frozen, flightless. How many hives abandoned? We cannot sleep too far from disaster zones. I saw a tornado once in my own front yard, slept through hurricanes, knelt during earthquakes. Did I pray? Did I ask for something then? I only held my breath. When later asked, are you okay? I said, everything is temporary. Mm. Cheerful, cheerful, cheerful. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, Introduction to S Disaster Preparedness from Janine Hollow Gailey's Field Guide to the End of the World. Thank you so much, Janine. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having me. Thanks to the audience. Yeah, thank you. Uh, remember that you can learn more about Janine Hall Gailey her poetry and her nonfiction guide PR for poets at www.webish6.com. And you can find her on Twitter and Instagram at webish6. everyone, I'm Managing Editor Mariah Richard here with author Whitney Hill to discuss everything and anything related to world building in fiction. Um, I'm really super excited to dive in, but before we do, Whitney, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, and you know, thank you for inviting me to be on the show today. Um, I'm Whitney Hill. I'm an award-winning author of uh, contemporary fantasy and paranormal romance, namely the Shadows of Other Side series. Um, and the Other Side Heat series. Um, I love hiking, I love video games, um, and I love world building and fantasy, so I'm excited to chat with you today. Thank you so much, Whitney. Um, so I have to say, when I first read Elemental, which is the first book in the Shadows of Other Side series, I was just so blown away by how masterfully you created Arden's world. Um, but I think that we all know that when something is really seamless in a novel, it just means that the author has spent a lot of time learning and honing uh, that part of their craft. So would you mind telling us a little bit about how you got started writing this kind of fiction? Yeah, so I got started with contemporary fantasy just from reading it a lot. Um, you know, so I think a lot of us get really inspired by the works that we read and then we jump into writing it sometimes. Um, but before that, I was actually writing fan fiction in um, like video game universes. So there's kind of been like a, a bridge over in that way. I think it's really interesting because um, I came to fan fiction kind of late in my writing career. Um, I didn't really start engaging in fandom that way until I was in my MFA program. And then it became uh, just this outlet for me to, um, to have fun, <laughs> you know, because I was, I was writing so much for deadlines to get grades um, and I just needed a, an outlet for it. Um, so as former fan fiction writer to fan fiction writer, um, what is something that you found really useful about writing fan fiction that kind of propelled you into crafting your own worlds? It's definitely around, you know, having a sandbox to work in. So when you're just getting into writing and you're trying to figure out your style and your voice and, 
you know, how you want to do different elements of characterization. Um, it can kind of help with all that to have a world that's been pre-built and you can just step into it um, and, and you know, you understand rules and that can carry over into your own world, world building, like original world building, because you're saying, oh, okay, you know, in this fan fiction experience, I had to think about like, what are the rules of this place? What are the rules of this culture? You know, what are the rules of this world? Um, so you get some practice working with it in that way. And then you kind of have a model almost that you can carry over for your own work. And it was just, you know, like you said, it's, it's a way to kind of escape. So it's, it takes the pressure off, at least for me, you know, from having to have everything figured out from the very beginning. I agree. And I think that, um, like being forced to work in, in someone else's rule book, uh, kind of taught me what I do like to write and what I don't, um, especially when it comes to like the mechanics of plot. Um, I really love hard world building. I love things that as a reader, I love to have a lot of rules. Um, but as a writer, I don't, I don't want to be constrained <laughs> so much. So that was something that, um, I, I really liked about fan fiction and I'm curious, um, Something else that I think is interesting when it comes to fandom in particular is how immediate feedback is. Um, is there anything that you can remember uh, from when you were just starting out? Any like particular feedback that you got that you thought like, wow, um, that's a really interesting thing to say and it's kind of stuck with you all these years? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so it was kind of a mixed bag. Like there was somebody who would come on and say like, oh, well, I don't think that would really happen. But then, you know, other people would come in and say, wow, I love how you handled this element of, you know, a potential plot hole or this element of the world. So you learn both how to take constructive criticism or, you know, just criticism generally. I think that's something that, you know, all writers are going to need to be comfortable with. Um, and the stakes are lower when it's not your own world so you have that you know that practice there but then you also have that great feedback that helps you learn what you do well um you know kind of like you were talking about so it's like oh okay this is what i like and also it's what people respond to so it's almost like again taking that sandbox and figuring out where you can really make your mark when you do your own work and i i do think that's interesting because i remember um the first time that anybody ever complimented my dialogue it was something that I had written for fan fiction. And it was just kind of like a throwaway comment, like, oh, I really loved this scene. You, you handle dialogue so well. And then um, I started really focusing on like, well, why would they say that? <laughs> like, what is it about the way that I construct dialogue that um, might have impacted them? So I really started to focus in on that. And then after that, I started to hear it in my MFA workshops. Like, oh, wow, it seems like your dialogue is really taking off. So it's like that really interesting um, correlation between like, yeah, you know, with anything that you put out there, you're going to get feedback that um, <laughs> isn't useful to you. But finding those, <laughs> like uncovering those little gems that you can be like, oh, I never really thought about it that way. Um, and especially like, I, I feel like, I don't know if this was your experience, but in the fandoms that I participate in, um, it seems like people are just there to like be joyous and have fun. So, you know, we're all just like screaming into a void about these people who don't <laughs> exist that we all share a mutual love for. <laughs> yeah, and that like, that was so much fun about it as well. Like just being able to experience something with other people and be brought together. I think maybe especially if, you know, you're feeling isolated in real life or, you know, you're finding it difficult, difficult to connect in other ways. It was just awesome to find those communities. So that, yeah, that was definitely something I loved as well. And um, so I'm actually like currently still writing fan fiction, um, but you'll never find me because I write anonymously. <laughs> but something <laughs> that has really like, it never occurred to me until I really started thinking about fan fiction from like a very like critical literary sphere. Um, like those people are experts and they will call you out if you don't do your research. And that really like, 
I had a thought the other day where I was like, wow, was I really bad at research before I started writing fan fiction? Because now, like, I feel like I'm, I have a question in my work in progress, and then I'm like, I know exactly how I can figure this answer. And I spend a lot less time crafting those details in my own world. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if that is, if research is something that plays a big part um, in, especially um, with Arden's world and like crafting, um, craft, because I know, uh, sorry, my brain just <laughs> hopped subjects, but I know that um, you live in the place where the Shadows of Other Side series is set. So did research play a really big role in in crafting Arden's story or were there things that you already kind of knew coming in? The setting and the research there were a huge part of it. Um, so I had actually had the idea like two and a half years before I sat down to write it. And all I knew was that I wanted to do a story about an air elemental um, and an elven prince. And that was kind of it. Um, but I didn't have anything about like, where was it set? Like I couldn't see anything about the world. I couldn't see anything about the story until I moved to North Carolina. And it was just kind of like, bang, like perfect because there was this kind of tri-city area. There was just a really lovely blend of like these wooded areas, but then also, you know, these cities. So it's like, okay, I can see, you know, vampires here. I can see elves here. I can see, you know, werewolves and everybody here. Um, so with that in mind, that research element really came in. Um, and a lot of the places that are featured in the books are places that I just physically went to and visited and, you know, walked around, took notes about, you know, sensory experiences, like what am I hearing, what am I smelling, um, like going beyond just what do I see. And then also um, just talking to people who have lived here longer. So it's definitely a lot around intense research. And if I couldn't find it, out in you know real life then it was google like what is the substrate of you know the earth around raleigh like is it feasible to have a basement <laughs> like random things and i think it's really interesting that you mention the sensory experience because um i think a lot of times for especially for writers who love to like hard world building um and really diving into that aspect of research I think it's important not to forget that like, yes, you want your world to feel real in the way that like your politics makes sense. And, you know, you understand why different communities um, interact with each other in certain ways and how things like gravity and money work. <laughs> um, but it's also really important that you are telling a story that your um, that your reader can really lose themselves in and feel a part of. Um, so that like, I think that's really awesome that you were able to like go to these places and really experience them for yourself. Because I do think that as you're reading um, your work, you really do feel that level of immersion Thank in you. the text. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's something yeah. I really care about. Like, not just, I don't, I don't want people to feel distracted by the details, but it's also how do I really transport you here? What are you feeling? What are you smelling? Like, just along with the characters. And as you're thinking about um, when you were crafting Arden's world, um, was there anything that really stumped you as you were like going from the world building process to writing the story? The rules of magic, um, because it was like, I knew that elemental magic needed to be part of it, but then it was also, everybody couldn't be an elemental. So how do elementals come about? Um, what are you know the other factions magic rules um how do those interact when they you know are fighting or when they collide it's, it's that whole thing of you know this needs to feel real so it needs to be believable and there's some level of hand waving that you can do with that but then at some point you're going to run into a situation where you're like well oh, that breaks the rules of the world like i don't know what to do now <laughs> <laughs> So when you hit those spots, how did you navigate them? How did you overcome? Um, it, you just have to be really creative around like what, I mean, because it's your world. You like, you can either make something up as long as you can justify it with something that happened previously, um, or 
you have to get really creative with the situation that you put the character in and how you get them out of it. Like, do they have friends? Do they have allies? Um, did some throwaway event from two books ago actually set up a nice, you know, kind of escape in this one? So it's just like within these kind of guardrails that you built, how are you kind of weaving through everything? I think it's really important to, as a writer, to continue to ask yourself questions. Um, I think for me, when I really start to get bogged down in the like heavy details, it's like even something as simple as like, is this, does this actually matter? <laughs> <laughs> like taking the time to ask yourself those questions of like, is this really important that I need to spend this amount of time for like a throwaway detail that might appear in chapter three and never appear again? <laughs> um, but it's, it's also really important when you come to those moments where you're like, okay, well, have I written myself into a corner? Is there something on a fundamental level that I need to go back and tinker with to make this plot work? Um, I think it's like, just being open to the curiosity of your world, yeah, I think is a really important thing. Um, and that my my threshold for frustration is very low. <laughs> so sometimes just being able to be like, this is not going to happen for me today. <laughs> I'm I can put this aside and uh, write an extra hour tomorrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or even just stepping away from your work for a little bit, because I think a lot of people have this idea that you have to write every single day. You have to do a certain word count or a certain time. And for me, that's just not how it works. I mean, I try to do something every day, but I also consider playing video games as writing time or watching a movie as writing time because I'm engaging with other works um, in such a way that I'm like, okay, how have they addressed conflict in this work? How have they addressed world building in this work? So it's like, I'm still enjoying it. I'm still being entertained, but I'm not, I'm not forcing myself to limit writing time to just sitting at the computer. And I really love that because I think sometimes we focus so much on what we're going to do to set our story apart from everyone else um, that we forget that like in, in this kind of um, like genre writing, there is just this communal like joy right? Like there's something that we all really, really love about things like magic that just work and they're, they're, you know, standard tropes. They're um, sometimes even cliches for a reason because we love them and it's okay to be inspired by um, someone else's work that you really, really love. As long as you're, you're not riding that line between like <laughs> ripping things off. <laughs> No, exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. Um, and creating something for yourself. Um, so switching a little bit more to, um, to like actual craft stuff. Do you have now, now that you have more experience with, you know, building your own universe, um, your own characters, do you have any like go to tips or tricks for yourself um, as you sit down to write? Always trying to anchor it in the character. Um, so a lot of times with setting, again, it's not just sensory details and how do I immerse the reader. It's also thinking about like, how is this character going to navigate this space? Um, if this character is a private investigator, what is she going to pay attention to? What is she going to notice? On the other hand, if this other character is an assassin or a commando, what are they paying attention to? Um, so just really taking like taking it out of my own head and taking it out of the reader's head and saying, well, wait a minute, who am I if I'm this character? And how do I change the experience of the world for that character? And then sometimes that is a way to get out of those tight spots that we were talking about earlier. That's really interesting. I think that um, especially for um, myself, who is very character driven as a reader, um, it's really interesting to think that like, yes, we do want to build these worlds and we want to tell these stories, but ultimately we're telling the stories about individuals and everything that we're doing to build their world should service them and their story in some way. Exactly. So like before I'm sitting down to write, I'm taking each of the, you know, 
there's the main character, like the point of view character, but then there's also four or five secondary characters. So it's like, of these main secondary characters, like, what are they doing? What is the point of their being here? <laughs> um, you know, and how are they navigating this? So it's like, parts of the world building do come from these secondary points of view. And I think just taking the time to plan that out. Um, and I say that as a pantser, but it can be useful to just kind of sit down and figure out like, well, what are they doing before you jump into it? Right. And I do think that that's also a way that um, you can avoid having those secondary characters that just feel like their only purpose is to serve the main character's journey, um, which is something that uh, if if you guys haven't read Elemental yet, you have to because there are so many characters in that book besides Arden that like, you know, within the first couple of chapters, I was like, I'm hooked. Like, I, I want to know everything about everybody. Like, I want to know where their stories end up because they are their own people. Um, they're not just like a prop to uh, move the plot along. So it's it's always really exciting to hear how authors approach that because I think, you know, secondary characters can be at least in a, in the first or second drafts, you know, they can be easy to, to just make like a little cardboard figurine, like <laughs> I'll get back to you at some point. <laughs> um, but remembering that, you know, this is how you enrich your world by building really awesome, believable characters. Um, so unfortunately, that's about all the time that we have left for today. Um, but I do really want to thank you so much for being here um, to talk with us about this, Whitney. Um, and for everyone listening, don't forget to check out today's show notes for links where you can find Whitney's novels. Until next time. For this episode's writing prompt, let's focus on setting in the short form. As you craft your story, poem, or short nonfiction piece, fully immerse your reader in the world you're creating. What does it sound like? What smells does it have? What objects is your narrator focusing their gaze on and how do they make them feel? I recommend setting a timer for yourself, say 10 minutes, and free writing as much as you can. Thanks for listening to Writer's Digest Presents. Join us in June when we'll be talking about vacation reads. Until then, you can visit writersdigest.com for more writing prompts, advice, and inspiration, and search for us on social on the usual platforms. Email us at writers.digest at aimmedia.com to share your feedback. We look forward to hearing from you.